Welcome back, everyone. I'm Kaya Carrington Russell, Australian award winning author of contemporary romance and kick butt heroines in dark fantasy worlds. And I have a very special guest for you today. We are talking New York Times and USA Today best selling author with over 1 million copies sold. Known for her contemporary, new adult, and young adult romance, for series such as One Week Girlfriend and Billionaire Bachelor, we are talking to the one and only Monica Murphy. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? You saying that makes me think I really need to update my uh, biography. <laughs> oh my God. What, what parts do we need to update? Two million. Is this like a 10 year old books or series? So, like, I need to. I mean, I was known for One Week Girlfriend. That's what broke out. And so, yeah, I just, you know how it is. You need to update all your stuff every once in a while. And you kind of forget. Yeah. Well, yeah <laughs> we're going to have a blast in the past. We're taking it back to the start anyway. There you so. go. Yeah, we're just going back 10 years. <laughs> what the progress line was like and where we're at today but <laughs> yeah I I am so curious as to why and where you started with writing what made you want to get into this world and how you found publishing for the first time so I mean I was a reader don't we all start as readers most of us and so I love to read ever since I was young and um and then I kind of, I remember my mom had a bag of romance books in the hallway closet in our house. And so I found all those books and I devoured them all. And then there was a little used bookstore that wasn't too far from where we lived, where there might still be credit. If it still exists, there might still be credit and on on my name there somewhere in a little index card. Anyway, so uh, uh I don't know. I just decided that I wanted to do that. Like I was originally a journalism major in college and uh, realized there's no money in journalism, but that's okay. And um, I just, I don't know. It's just something that I always wanted to do and I would play around at it and I would write scenes here and there, but it never got serious until I started staying home with my kids my two youngest and uh decided oh I'm taking care of two babies why not try and write something too like like life wasn't crazy enough right you know when I started I I know you mentioned it but like well you didn't mention it but Karen Erickson name is how I originally started is that's the um name I used first it's really interesting that so if you went from journalism and because I I dabbled in this a little as well and it's a very conditioned form of writing. You can't be as creative as when you're writing books. So I imagine that would have been a lot more expressive for you. And so when you wrote that first book, how long did it take you to write? And did you uh, self-publish? Did you go through an agent and a traditional publisher? What did that path look like for you? So like the first book I ever wrote was trash and it has never seen the light of day. So I will say as being a journalism major, I feel like it teaches you to be a little bit more deliberate in your word choice and you don't, I don't, I can ramble, I can ramble, don't get me wrong, but I like, or I can be, I don't know, I don't think I've ever really been accused of being too overly descriptive and I think that stems from being a journalism major and I I worked at the local newspaper in the town where I grew up, like as an intern. And so, you know, I did write some stuff and of course doing class projects, whatever else. And so I think that that helped. Uh, starting out, I was, it was a different landscape. Publishing was a whole different landscape when I first started out. And there were um, digital publishers that were becoming popular. Uh, Alora's Cave, Sam Hain. I mean, I could go on and on. There are all kinds of little ones. And um, that's how I first started out. I wrote a novella and I submitted it to a small publisher that is no longer with us or was even a big name and I sold it. And so my first uh, royalty check was 42 bucks. And I felt like, woohoo. So let's go to lunch. Anyway, um, so I started out doing that and I just kind of kept at it. And uh, I did, I had an agent lost an agent, got another agent, fired that agent, went back to my original old agent. I've had a, quite a few agents. And so um, I have been what you would consider traditionally published, I guess you could say with the smaller digital publishers and then the digital first with like um, 
Harlequin Har Harper Collins mm -hmm. through both Karina Press and then in later with um, Avon and Avon Impulse. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I've also self-published as well and found big success as as Monica um, in early 2013 with a self-published book that then I went on to sell to that series to Random House. Yeah, amazing. I want to talk more about when it comes to agents and traditional publishers, because as you said, you've uh -huh. had um, multiple agents, which I love because I think uh -huh. perhaps sometimes when people go into this, they expect that it's going to be the right, the first person's going to be the right fit. And that's not always the case. And also we grow and develop as well. And sometimes it means that we need new business relationships and such. And the same with having multiple contracts, multiple publishers, do you have advice for anyone that's looking at both of those avenues when it comes to agent and traditionally published as well? Like for an agent, it's, I feel like, I mean, we can always say times are hard to find someone like that, but like, I mean, you need to really ask yourself, depending on what avenue that you want to take, do you really need an agent? Do you need one? Or do you want to just self-publish? And there's nothing wrong with just self-publishing. You can make a really great career out of that. And you don't necessarily need an agent to make it happen. So uh, I would really tell anybody to look first on what they need. And I will say this too, to go with a traditional publisher, just because you're with a traditional publisher does not mean that it is going to be life-changing. Uh, and I say that because... They don't do, oh, this sounds so bad. They don't do a lot for you, but they don't, you know, like they'll edit. So you don't have to pay for edits. You don't have to pay for the cover. You, they take care of that all yourself. But there's there's also headaches that come with that too. I cannot lie. I've loved every editor I've ever had though. I have to state that straight up. Random, my Random House editor, I will still talk to her this to this day wonderful woman there's a lot of great people out there in the publishing biz but dealing with a publisher compared to self-publish are different beasts because you control everything in self-pub you have a set you it's your final say for all of it and you can get get it out a lot faster too so i would just say really look and see what you want to do yeah. what do you want to do do you want to see your book in a store well nowadays i feel like you can still, even as a self-pub. So it depends. Yeah. And That's I think- Great answer. It, I end it with it, it depends. <laughs> but it, it's so true and it's different for everyone as well. Your first book, what year was that when it published? Uh, what, are you talking as my very first thing that I published? Yeah. The novella I mentioned? Yeah, 2006. So <laughs> yeah, so it was a long time ago and there was a lot of different- Things going on. We were looked down upon so badly being with digital publishers. We really were. They did not treat us as real authors. And I'm talking about RWA. They were terrible. All the old, you know, the older authors around. And then by about 2009, 2010, then they started coming to us and being like, how much money do you make again? Oh, we're really interested in that. And we're like, uh huh. Now you are. <laughs> So interesting to see how much the landscape has changed over the last 20 years as well because I remember entering it in 2014 and even then it was still in that stage that murky stage where people were advocating that traditional publishers were automatically better than self-published because there was a less of quality or something such as and that was never the case people were still paying a lot of money for good editing for good covers whatever it may be and it's interesting now where you're noticing, especially for TikTok, for example, um, I hate coming back to TikTok, but it is such a huge part at the moment okay, yeah. of our yeah. industry. Um, but it's just, it's put everyone on an even game again. It's just made made the dream even more possible, I feel like. As you said, getting into bookstores, you know, we've got those TikTok made me buy at tables and things like that. We never had opportunities like that. And it's just, it must be interesting for you just being under 20 years, seeing how much that's changed over the, over the time. What would what would you say the most surprising thing you found in the industry has been so far? Well, what I think is so funny, I'll say this right now. What is so funny is the there's a lot of readers out there, and I don't I don't mean to 
put them down because I'm not, but there's people who are calling themselves OG readers who are upset about the TikTokers taking over, making a chain. Oh yeah, they're they're not happy. They are OGs. We just, you know, we've been here a long time. We started with this. And I'm, then I think to myself, according to me and what I've witnessed in this business, you guys were already the OGs. There were OGs before them. Like this is the third generation of readers I am now seeing start to, you know, come out on the scene and become the dominant buyers uh, and supporters of books right now. So it's just funny to see that because it's like, nobody's an OG. It's been going on for a long time. It just cycles in, cycles out. It does. And it's about on a 10 year, at least from what I've seen, it's on about a every 10 year cycle. I will say I'm very surprised by the success that books are seeing because of TikTok. But then again, it reminds me of the boom that we had in 2013 when indies came out and people really started shouting about them. It's very similar. And what's so crazy is that Colleen Hoover rode that wave then, and now she's 50 times bigger now. So I think it's awesome to see her do so well all over again, even better. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's pretty cool. And that's the thing. And I think that's why it can be difficult at times for a lot of authors because you have to learn to pivot and change with what the market is doing. And for some of us, that doesn't come naturally. You know, not all of us like have, say, business majors, or actually a lot of us don't have that kind of background. So, yes. it's learning yes. where we go and supporting each other um, with what information that we have. So, it's, it's interesting how it changes quite often. It does change. And, you know, I really, think that, that, yes, there's not a lot of people out there who write, who have solid business sense. And then there are people who are able to pivot really easily. And, um, and there's so many, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, there's so many romance writers who are attorneys, former lawyers. I think that's so yeah. funny. It's like a lot of them got into, um, you know, got into that side of the business. They're like, eh, and then they decided to go on their creative side. I think it's so fun. It's never surprising to me anymore when they're like, oh, I used to be a lawyer. Oh, yeah, of course you did. So many of them, yep. which is funny to me, but that's great. Yeah, it's they so probably have pretty good business sense, I would think. Oh, you'd think so, yeah. It's interesting, though, because whenever you, like, talk to people about previously what their, like, career or what their job choices were, and then you're just like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what kind of background you have or what experiences you have. And it's kind of uplifting in that way too, because quite literally, if you're determined enough to be sitting here and say, I'm an author, you can do it. Anyone can do it. Yes. Yes. You don't need to be a, um, uh, English major or studied, you know, whatever. So I know there's people who have great success. They do special, there's like workshops out there that like curate authors. It's like very prestigious mm -hmm. and they go on to win awards and write books. But I mean, if you are persistent enough, you can write a book and yeah. you can still publish it. So yeah, it's kind of wild. I'd love to talk about your writing process a little bit. How do you write? Are you a plotter? Are you a pantser? Do you have a routine? Um, yeah, what's your your special source? I am a panster. I don't like to plot. I feel like it takes the joy out of writing for me. Um, I know some people will plot everything down and that's what works for them. In my earlier years of trying to learn different methods and and you know, reading books and workshops and whatnot, you know, none of that was a waste of time because you can always pick up something, but I ultimately learned that I just can't change my writing style. I tried at one point. I wanted to become a plotter because I felt like it would make my life easier. And I just I found out that I just didn't like it. Um, it. Like I said, it just takes all the fun out for me. I will, though, like if I'm getting, I noticed lately when I get to the end of a book and I know I have so many chapters left, I list out everything I need to do before I before I um, go in and finish it. And that really helps keep me on track. So I like that. Um, I, I mean, I write, I try to write almost every day. If it's not a hectic online, you know, deadline schedule, then I do it like at least five days a week. But um, when it's hectic, which I, 
had shared with you earlier that it was really hectic these last few months. Um, yes, I was writing almost almost every single day. And I could write a lot of words in a day. I people will. I know that there's a lot of debate about that if it's quality words, if it's not quality words. But I from high school, I took a typing class in high school. I can type really fast. I worked office before I started writing. Like I, I'm pretty fast when it comes to typing, and I think it helps. And the longer you've been at it, I just feel like I think it also though depends on what kind of just if you're fast or not. There are people who do 2k a day, and that's fantastic. I can do upwards of five. I can average 5k a day, which is a lot. Yeah. What's you what's know, the most you've ever written in a day? Out of curiosity. I mean, it's a lot. I've done close to 10. All right. Yeah. So like lovely. when I was, <laughs> well, like um, when I wrote A Million Kisses last year, I wrote it in a very short period of time because I wanted to get it out during the time period. Like, oh, like I need a release before my next one, the one that was already done releases. And so I wrote it really fast and I lost 12,000 words at one point just a computer glitch problem. And so that I cried and thought about pushing it out. And then the characters were just so in my head. I was just like, I can't. So I wrote, I was writing seven to 8,000 words a day in a very short window and about made myself lose it, but that's okay. I finished it. And then it, it's done great. So I guess I can't complain, but um, yeah, that's not normal though. I don't normally do that. That is so, I think, for any author who is listening to this, losing, say, 12,000 words a day or whatever it is, computer glitch happening, almost every single person I know in this industry has had that moment and you just want to throw in the towel and give up on life as is and you're just like, there's no point, I can't do this because it takes so much time and effort and losing such a huge portion. But do you know what? All of us keep doing it. We go back in, we give ourselves a breather and because it has to get yeah. done because we want it to be done. Yes. Before we started this interview, you told me that you just finished three deadlines. You had three deadlines going and now you're giving yourself a little bit of a break, which I love to hear because we need to do more of that. Yeah, How did do. you juggle three books at once? How was that experience for you and any advice for those who are trying to bite something off so significant? So part of my problem was the way the deadlines hit. I have something that will be coming out next year that has not been announced yet, but they wanted it by a certain time period. And then um, I had uh, my next Lancaster book coming out, but I'm doing a simultaneous release with my UK publisher. So they needed it by a certain time period to... Um, have it ready to print to be out in stores on release day in the UK Commonwealth. So I had to get that in by a certain time. So I did some juggling because I don't like to go a long time without a book release. And it felt like I released Playing Hard to Get in December, December 1st. And then at the rate I was going, I wasn't going to have another book out until May, mid-May, which is when I'll always be with you out. So I decided to write uh, playing by the rules in February. And so I, I wrote that whole book in February. I just busted it right out. And so that's why I was able to, I had, I'll always be with you, which I wrote over a certain time period. I stopped, I worked on something else and then I went back to it. And then I had to do, um, I went through and read over the book that is not coming out till next year, added the ending and then, will be able to turn that in so I mean it's just it's I don't recommend doing this I don't normally stack myself up like this and uh I went a little uh not so I think over it just it was a lot but you just my thing is I can't focus on the big picture if I look at everything that's due or whatever I, I freak myself out so I have to go day by day and then I have count over the days, figure out how many words I have to do per day, you know, that kind of thing. And so, and then when you set deadlines, like with your, your editors that you hire, like then you, I don't like to be late to that either because I want to respect everyone's schedule. 
you know, my editor, my freelance editor has a schedule. She has multiple clients. I don't want, I mess it up. It messes it up for everybody. So I, I want to, you know, I don't want to do that. So I just, I'm very strict with myself and this is the way it has to be. Now, granted, my children are grown. I don't have little kids to take care of anymore. My youngest is 18. So um, I think that difference 10 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to, to do this as much, you know, or even five years ago. So that is, I think, a big help. I have a lot more time on my hands. And this is my job. It's my full-time job. It's what I've been doing for a long time. So I, I wouldn't recommend what I just got through. Do not recommend. Zero out of 10. The one thing I want to bring up, what I love is you're a New York Times, USA Today bestselling author with also a million copies sold, which is just such an incredible feat. But I'm curious if one of those were the most... Um, recognizable moments for you or whether there was something that was a little bit more sentimental for you in your career that you thought wow I've really made it or I've really done this yeah so you know at, I started out as Karen and so I I published for a long time as Karen and I never hit any lists um we weren't even recognized digital books weren't even recognized on any of the bestseller list, maybe on, I don't know when it started to be recognized on USA Today, but I know for a fact it wasn't until 2010 on the New York Times bestseller list. And so I remember one of my friends was the second person to ever hit the New York Times as a digital book. And so that was a big deal, you know? So uh, as Karen, I never really hit. As Monica, I hit the USA Today in February, I believe, of 2013. That was a big deal. When I released the second book in the One Week Girlfriend series, they both hit the New York Times, the first and the second one. So that was a that was a huge deal. That was amazing. But, you know, I'm driving my daughter to dance class when I found out. You know what I'm saying? It's just like things still happen to humble you down. You still have to go home and make dinner or change out the laundry or whatever. What I really loved is when I had... <laughs> As Karen with one of my old publishers, I wrote a, we took the first five chapters of a book and we made it free. Okay. And so that was a couple of months before the book actually came out. I was torn to shreds, incomplete book, blah, blah, blah. They didn't seem to get that. It was just, you know, kind of like a taste, a sample, you know, but all these people pre-ordered the next book and that book hit the USA Today as Karen and it was such a big deal to me. And I remember coming home and telling my family, and they're all kind of like, eh. and I was this is Karen who did it. It wasn't Monica who did it. It was Karen. And they're like, oh, that's great. <laughs> that one really meant a lot to me. Just because as Karen, I've been doing this one, you know, or doing working this career for a long time. So yeah. that one, that one meant a lot to me. How do you find managing both names now? I don't, I don't anymore. I don't write as Karen anymore. It's too, it's too hard. That's another one. Would not recommend. <laughs> I know publishers sometimes request it. I know that um, sometimes people will differentiate, you know, I write as, let's just say I was going to write fantasy, which I'm not, um, M. Murphy. You know, and I and I get that, you know, just kind of uh, differentiate the styles of books that you're writing. But, you know, I chose to do uh, use the pen name Monica because of I was writing something so totally different than what I wrote as Karen. And, and so I thought to myself, if I fail, no one will know. And then she went and did better. So uh, that's why I chose to do it. It's just because of the difference, such a different style. So, yeah. yeah. Does Monica Murphy still go out to traditional publishers as well, or is it independently published only? I mean, I I will go out to traditional publishers, yes. And um there is there is stuff brewing as Monica traditionally. Also, though, like with and I have before, because I was with Random House, I was with Harper Collins. I've done stuff with Entangled in the past as both Karen and as Monica. And um, I will say that like working with my UK publisher, 
they've been wonderful with the Lancaster series and it's done really well there too. So it's, it's pretty cool to, to have that as part of the whole makeup. It's different having to do it this way, like having to coordinate the release to simultaneously release was something that was logistically different compared to what I normally do. But I mean, I also think it helps that I also have traditional experience so you kind of already know how that works so but yeah yeah I don't mind having my my feet in both yeah. you know both uh baskets. lines I guess I'd say baskets I always you know people say don't like to put all our eggs in one basket but I will say this the KU basket is really profitable so I don't mind having a lot of eggs in, in that as well yeah I'd actually like to that's one of my favorite questions to ask. It's a good old KU versus wide debate. And yeah, both are yeah. equally incredible and they both work for different names. And I love that. So what made you decide to take the plunge into KU and then decide to stay there? So, you know, I've been wide pretty much the entirety of my career because there was no such thing as KU when I first started. I mean, I remember when we first had the, uh, when I first started, we weren't even selling on Amazon. You sold at the, there was a couple of third-party vendor sites and then the publisher site itself. And then all of a sudden uh, people are like, oh, what is this Kindle? You know, we, that's how I feel like a dinosaur. Anyway, so uh, I realized that the series that I was starting to work on was, very much in line with what was popular on Kindle Unlimited. And that would be the Callahan series. And so um, we released, I released it and had it out for a few days. And then I went to my publicist, Nina, shout out to Nina and said, Hey, I think I want to put this in KU. And she's like, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah. And so then we did it. And I've never looked back like KU has totally worked for me. So yes, but I will never, I'll never um, crap on other people's choices. I think that wide can work for people. I think that KU can work for people. I don't like it when I hear other authors out there saying you need to do it this way. And this way is the only way it's not There are so many ways. And um, yeah. I just, I feel like we all can make our own choices and some people's, everyone's level of success is different. And uh, yeah, I think that I, I support all choices. So you want to be wide, be wide. If you want to be KU, be KU. One thing that I found that was really cool about, like a lot of things are cool about you, but um, you were on like BuzzFeed, Forbes, Pop Sugar, like a whole pile of other publications as well. And I'm just like, how do you even get, onto those what what happened so I mean I got it's not even that big of a deal I got chosen like a couple of times for a book to be like on top spring reads on BuzzFeed um there was an author friend who used to write for Pop Sugar so she would include a bunch of our books right so it's just you know but it sounds good right it just sounds buzzy Forbes I had nothing to do with that they were talking about 2013 they talked about self-published authors and how so many of them went from self-publishing to being acquired by publishers. And it was like me, they mentioned me, Rachel Van Dyke, Jennifer Armantrout, um, Molly McAdams, a whole bunch of us. So, you know, that was kind of cool. That impressed my mother. <laughs> impressed. Ooh, of impressed yeah. <laughs> and this is the thing. These are like, I feel small wins in in the journey in the career like when you've been doing it for a while especially um you know as I said just under 20 years which is amazing you have these little pockets that you're like that's actually really cool and I yeah. think it like highlights the week for you you know I would say that probably the coolest thing is to be translated into a foreign language that's really cool that's really cool to see um other people from other countries love your books and um that has probably been one of the coolest things that i i've seen and to have, see the 
reactions to them. And, and when I, I went to, I was able to go to the rare uh, Rome signing in 2019. And I had a lot of people tell me there, you were one of the first romance books I've ever read. And that's because they didn't have a lot of romance. I guess that was popular until the publishers were acquiring us from 2013, 2014. So I was shocked by that. I didn't realize it didn't, it didn't go back as far, you know, I thought it went back farther, but I got a lot of comments like that. I was like, oh, okay, that's That's great. But it's, it's, it's so cool to see um, people from other countries. It's, I feel lucky that it translates because sometimes it doesn't, you know, I've had series that not do as well, but sometimes it doesn't translate and sometimes it does. And that's so cool. Well, then let's dive into translations. What advice do you have for authors who are wanting to dive into translations but not sure exactly where to start or whether it's the best investment for them even because it is an investment? So I've only ever done it by selling through to, through an agent. So I don't have any advice on that only because I just don't have the experience. I know that there are some authors out there who have great uh, success having translations, paying for translations themselves. And I know it's a big process and I've known some people who have done it and they feel like it's been a total fail. So I've been lucky that I've sold and done it that way. So, cause I just don't think I, there's only so much that my brain can handle. I just don't think I could um, take the time to also work on translations on my own, but I know that there are people who are very successful at it. So I would suggest do your research. And that it's already a lot like what we, what we do in one day is a lot. So, and I, I love this discussion too understand your strengths and understand your weaknesses you know if you don't feel comfortable especially in something that is a lot of money to invest because translations are a lot of money especially if you decide to do it on your own and then you do have that option get an agent find a set like you know do it that way so I love that I think that's a fantastic option um and a lot of people probably are looking at that avenue so as you said do your research I want to know a little bit about your release magic so do you have a particular strategy you use every time or there's like three must do's for you when you have a release coming out I mean I have my publicist I'm with Valentine PR and so it's great for them to do a lot that they do and then I don't have to worry about it I mean I always I always shout more you know like I want to if it's a, I'm, you sh- we should feel this way about all of our books. I know that not every book we love as much as another, but like there are elements in our books that we of course love because we created it. And I think part of that helps is our enthusiasm for it, shouting about it on our social media. Um, our newsletter is so important. I think a newsletter is extremely important and it's a, it's a process to test out what works, what doesn't. But I think that that is a valuable resource that every author should have and and utilize. And don't be scared to send it to them uh, once a week because, I mean, up to release day sometimes, I'll send it out. I'll segment it and send it out to, like, my highly engaged subscribers. I'll send it three, four times leading up to release in, like, one week just to get them excited, you know. And, and, um, I mean, ads, we all do ads. I do Facebook ads. I've done Amazon ads. I think that helps. I don't know. I just, I haven't really changed it up too much over the last few years, but I, it helps when you grow and you have an audience and, and you can count on them to hopefully read it. But you know, sometimes things are amiss. I can't lie. I have some books that were misses. I've had quite a few books that were misses. <laughs> so, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Do your own Facebook ads or do you hire out? I have hired out, and I've also done that myself. Currently, well, I have no none running right now, but currently I do my own. So, And where yeah. did you learn that skill set? Was it doing courses or just trying it out for yourself, getting a feel for it on lower budgets or... I mean, so I have hired out and then you can kind of look at what they do you know, it's in your dashboard. So you can kind of see what they do. I have listened to, um, 
I'll, I'll, I'll say this. Megan Quinn gave a workshop on Facebook ads at the Romance Author Mastermind, I believe in 21, 2021. It was great. And that kind of helped um, visually. Sometimes it can get a little, you know, we, we all know. It can get a little complicated in there. AMS makes my head spin. Like, I don't even understand the majority of that. I try to figure that out. And then I just spend money. <laughs> and I don't feel like I do know what I'm doing. But Facebook ads, I feel like I've got a decent handle on. So, yeah. But, but, trial and error, discussing with friends, you know, all of that. Looking back in your author career, what would you say your greatest obstacle has been and your greatest accomplishment? <laughs> greatest obstacle i guess a greatest obstacle would be just trying to get your foot in the door anywhere with a publisher with an agent for every win you know quote around win that you can see publicly there's a a, a trail of rejections and losses behind it um so i i would say yeah that <laughs> it's just kidding my best advice now, I used to say my best advice to anybody who wanted to be an author was finish the book. I would say now my best advice to give any author is don't quit. Yeah. Don't quit. I have been at this for so long. And like, I, there's a handful of people that I personally know who've been in it as long as I have. And there are gobs who have quit, who have disappeared, who might be writing under another name. I don't even know. But don't quit. That's my best advice. Just keep doing it. What would you say your greatest achievement has been? I just don't even know. Like, I'm really proud of the career I have. You know, I've been, um, I've been a full-time writer at, and just supporting the fam mm -hmm. for a solid 11, 12 years. So I'm proud of that. I mean, I worked really hard to get where I'm at. And I've had... This career is a roller coaster. It is not for the faint of heart. It is. You can't get discouraged when you dip. You, you just, you know, like it's, you're not going to hit one out every single time. It just doesn't happen. But if you stick around long enough, it might come back around again. I kind of feel like I'm having a come back around again moment right now. And it's kind of awesome. But yeah, it's, it's really awesome. And I think TikTok, I think book talk. Um, but I'm ho I'm hoping to manage it a little better this time. Yeah. Than what happened last time. So as best as we can anyway. Because <laughs> a lot as of it best as we can, because a lot of it is out of our control. But I feel like in years past, a lot of things happened to me and I didn't necessarily make things happen. Then you just say yes to those things. And this time around, I feel like I'm trying to be more careful and purposeful with my choices. I love that. What is then, yeah. this is my favorite question to ask, what is the big goal for you? What is a dream that you're chasing for your career? The bigger, the better. I mean, a movie or a series or whatever. That would just be amazing. Yeah. Like that's a, that would be cool. Yeah. Let's tick it. I can't wait then. What's, what <laughs> is there a book series that you would love to see on there? Yeah, the, probably the Lancaster series, A Million Kisses. I think that would be amazing. Yep. That is you know, I always have said that One With Girlfriend was my bestseller, but A Million Kisses, I think, has surpassed it. So um, I just think that it's a story that it seems to have resonated with a lot of people. And I would love to see that translated to screen. To screen. But I mean, you know, it's also like big, big dream. Yeah. We'll see. Which we can make happen. <laughs> <laughs> Manifest. That's what my daughter always says. Yes. Manifest. manifest. That's a big manifest. I'm like, yes, manifest. Um, yes, we're gonna manifest it. I I have a, a segment called Speed Dating with an Author. I've lit a candle. I've created ambience. We're going on a very romantic. <laughs> but oh, right. what it is is five rapid fire questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. What's the clumsiest moment you've ever had? You know, there was a signing. I don't remember which one. I like fell like on camera. Like they were doing some sort of documentary, but they cut it out. But I literally like tripped over something. And I just fell to the ground, sprawled right. I'm, I fall. I fall a lot. Ask my kids, ask my husband. 
And um, yeah, that was embarrassing. That's great though. That's Not so very many people saw it though. So that's good. It was the first that's time I'm admitting it. So there you go. <laughs> so I feel like this is just such a classic scene. We would write one of our books. And when it happens to us, we're like, damn it. <laughs> oh, totally. It was a total like, oh my God moment. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh it was bad I I know an author who she was going out for an award and as she went out for an award she tripped up the stairs and I was like wow that's just like everyone's nightmare and she's like yeah I did it right what are the three words that would best describe you I mean I like I, I, I I'm a loyal friend I think I'm a um I think I'm a good mother and I uh I like to say that I'm a good writer like I'm proud of my accomplishments. Good. You should be. Yeah. <laughs> that was so bad. You should be. Get it, girl. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> what um, is a unique talent or skill set that you have that not a lot of people know about? I mean, that one, I just, you know what? I sound like an old woman, but I kind of like to, like, especially during the pandemic, I was puttering around in my rose bushes in the in the yard all the time. And uh, I treated those things like my babies. I kind of neglect them more now. Shame on me. But that's, I guess, my secret talent is that I can, I can nurture a rose bush like nobody's business. <laughs> what is the song that best describes you? Oh my gosh, that I don't even know. I couldn't even tell you. I'm sorry. That one I just don't know. Do you have um, who's one of your favorite uh, bands or singers? Well, right now it, it's all Taylor Swift in this house all the time because the con, you know, the tours is kicked off. We're going to the concert here in August. So, um, yes. So maybe, maybe I'm like, a, my daughter will be like, you're a fake fan, but I'm a, I'm a wannabe Swifty. How's that? <laughs> I love it. And who has your <laughs> favorite character to write and why? You can only choose one. My favorite character? That I've written? Oh, gosh. <laughs> it's so hard. It's so hard. It's always going to end up being like the one that you just last worked on. You know what I mean? You know what? I'll say this. I really love that. Um, and I know there's love and hate for this. I'm going to bring up a million kisses again. But like, uh, there's a lot of readers who really resonated with Ren, the female character in, in the book. And while I always, not always, but you see a lot of um, posts and whatnot about your heroes that you're right, your, your male characters. Um, I get a lot of stuff about Ren and I kind of love that. That's so good. I kind of love that. So well, what's one of your favorite things about Ren? You know what my favorite thing about Ren was, is that I made her into this person at the beginning of the book and I got a lot of I almost well can I curse I, I got a lot of shit over it uh of her being really prissy and uptight and judgmental and I did that on purpose I wanted her to be that way I wanted her to be that way because then she slowly but surely changes and he helps to make her see things but she also opens her own eyes to things and so that's what I love is that she's open to change and willing to change I have had so much fun today. So tell us what's coming out. What do we need to be on the lookout for? And most importantly, where do we find you? Yes. I mean, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook. Monica Murphy author is my username. Website, Monica Murphy um, TikTok, Monica Murphy author. Um, my next book coming out is next week, uh, March 30th playing by the rules it's hard they all start with playing so I get confused um each of those books is a standalone but it is about a, well it's really about siblings there's the oldest brother who was in playing hard to get and now his sisters are getting books and so this one is about his sister and his best friend you know gotta love brother's best friend trope right so that comes out next week but they all stand alone you don't need to read the first one to read the second one and I'm excited for it to come out he's a little the first book was a little more lighthearted, and this one the hero is a little more broody and and stay away from me but ooh, I can't resist you kind of situation yeah so I'm looking forward to uh getting that out there into the world I'm excited you had me at broody 
right? He's a little broody. He's a little, he's a little silly. <laughs> the way he behaves. I will definitely be one clicking that. So I can't wait. And March 30th, wasn't it? March 30th. Yes. Not too long now. I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah. It's coming right up. Well, I have had so much fun and uh, who knows, maybe, maybe we'll keep an eye out over the next year. Yeah. See where you're at. And maybe we'll get you back on. Okay, great. Yeah, no, this has been great. Thank you so much for having me, Kai. I really enjoyed it. Absolutely. And until then, I'll see you all next time, guys. Bye. Bye.